Okay. So, uh, last week in his uh, webcast, which many people here saw or heard on the internet, LaRouche located the upcoming Washington, D.C. primary uh, in the stage of history. And as he said, you can't understand the primary, you can't understand who you are unless we go back to uh, the, our, our real forebearers, which are Solon, Thales, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato. He referenced, of course, that they all stood in the shadow of Egypt, which I'll touch on briefly at a certain point, but that won't be the subject of this class. But to actually understand where we are now, uh, who we are, who we're fighting, you, we, we, ha we do have to go back 2,400 years. And what I'm going to look at tonight is the absolutely intense political battle that Plato himself was engaged in throughout the entirety of his life. This guy was not an ivory tower philosopher. Uh, he was captured twice. He was almost sold into slavery once. Uh, uh, he was almost killed once. He traveled all over this region uh, trying to organize the forces which could defeat the Persian Empire, which was the oligarchy of the day. Uh, the Persian Empire was essentially the friends of Dick Cheney 2,500 years ago. The same mentality. Man is an animal. A handful of us have the right to rule over the rest of you, turn you into slaves, loot you, and so on and so forth. Plato's entire life was engaged in both the political battle to defeat them, but the battle to master the ideas necessary so that his relatively small forces could actually defeat this apparently much larger power because, as some of you may know, this entire area and out the window was ruled by the Persian Empire. And at the time of Plato and Socrates, the Persians had conquered Egypt. They'd come all the way down here. They'd conquered most of this area in Turkey and so on. And, of course, Greece is this little thing right here, and Athens is even smaller right there with some allies in Italy. So what Plato had to develop is ideas which could allow his forces to exert greater power in the universe such that they could figure out how to defeat the Persians. Now, it should be said that over the course of Plato's life, he died at the age of 80, um, there were several battles that were won, but the overall war, war was lost, uh, only to be really won right now by what we're doing. Uh, but I want to look at I, I want to, but I want to look at Plato. For, I want people to, to have a, a sense of Plato as a living, breathing person, very, very much like Lyndon LaRoche. Uh, and I want to look, constantly try and keep people looking at the, the, in a sense, the generational question which Lynn is addressing. That is, how you're thinking today, how your parents' thinking, is shaped by certain singular events in history events which you might not even be so much aware of today uh, or might not have much life for you. For example, uh, in June of 1944, July of 1944, at the Democratic Convention, Franklin Roosevelt's Vice President, Henry Wallace, was dumped in favor, of ha in favor of Harry Truman. Everything that happened to your parents is because of that event in July, everything of substance in terms of their, their, their lives. Because the dumping of Wallace meant a change in the direction of the country. The, our enemies understood that Roosevelt wasn't going to live out his term. This was 1944. And as it was, he died in 1945, less than a year after uh, that convention. So they knew that whoever the vice president was going to be was going to, was going to be the next president and was going to determine the direction of the United States in the post-war per period. Henry Wallace, who was... Uh, Roosevelt's vice president from 1940 to 1944 was an American system advocate. He really embodied the idea of the United States as a great republic, the idea of the United States as committed to the general welfare, that the nation developed through science and technology, that we had a responsibility to the rest of the world. In fact, one of the reasons Wallace was dumped is he was out of the country in the months before the convention. Uh, and he was meeting with China. He was in South America. He was meeting with the countries that could be our post-war partners in actually developing the world. We could help them develop. 
they could help us develop other parts of the world and so on. He was fulfilling the Roosevelt idea of a world of sovereign nation states in the post-war period. And there were maneuverings which took place while he was out of the country. Eleanor Roosevelt was also on a similar mission. And as a result of that, uh, uh, at the convention, he was dumped and Harry Truman was put in. What did that mean? It meant we dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki because Truman would not have done that. It meant that the United States adopted a preemptive nuclear war doctrine, at least until Russia, until the Soviet Wallace Union. Would never have done that. Huh, and Henry Wallace never would have done that. Uh, said Truman would oh, I'm sorry. Henry Wallace never would have. Henry Wallace never would have dropped the bomb. Truman, and so the, putting Truman in at that point shaped the entire post-war period. Some of us here have seen the, the play, The Big Knife by Clifford Odets, which which is a very visceral picture of the degeneration of the United States in the late 1940s because of the demoralization of having Wallace, uh, having Truman in there instead of Wallace, uh, and the the uh, the moral degeneration of the World War II generation, which had been a great generation in World War II, had defeated fascism, but came back and shrank under Trumanism, took place. That, that entire history was encapsulated by the shift that was made the minute Wallace was dumped and Truman was put in. I mean, it was followed, it was carried through after Roosevelt died. But the moment that change took place, uh, there was a characteristic shift in the direction of this country. Uh, the same thing happened with my generation with the Kennedy assassination. Hope was reborn when Kennedy was brought in as president that we would go back to the Roosevelt outlook, that would be, we would be a great nation committed to helping the rest of the world develop uh, based on science and technology, going to the moon, uh, and so on. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. People took that seriously when Kennedy said that in 1961. And his assassination was another one of these changes. The chance of, of going in the right direction shifted at that instance. And we suddenly were going in the wrong direction, which we haven't reversed since then. So there have been a, we're, and we're now at a point where we're at the end phase of those two shifts in the, the, those two shifts which have led us to this point. The Washington DC primary gives us the opportunity. The election of 2004 gives us the opportunity to bring about a shift back in the other direction. Now if you look at Plato's life, it's, a, it's, it's in a very, very similar setting to this. That is, there was a degeneration of society which had taken place over a generation, two generations, three generations. Plato devoted his entire life to bringing about a shift in the right direction. And as we'll see, he won a couple of battles along the way, uh, but they were undermined by the overwhelming force of the oligarchy. Uh, and, uh, and, but if you look at the, the scope of his entire life, it is very, very much like the scope of LaRouche's life. You fight for a long time. You win a battle here, but mostly you lose. But what you're fighting for is not the individual battle. What you're fighting for is that change in direction, that change in the underlying characteristic of your society. Is your society based on the idea of man in the image of a creator with cognition exerting dominion over the universe for the betterment of everybody? Or is your society based on the idea that we're animals and some have a better right to rule over us than the rest? It's, it's, it's that battle that Plato's entire life was engaged in. Now, it's actually very interesting if you look at even the time frame uh, of Plato's fight uh, and, uh, 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 oh, and, and, in a sense, LaRouche's fight, because Plato was born in about 420, was born in 427 BC. Uh, he met Socrates at the age of se uh, 20 in 407 BC, and he picked up the baton after Socrates was executed in 399 and fought for the next 60 years. Now, you think of the same sweep of time since Truman became vice president in 1944 and where we are today, 60 years. The same sweep of time that Lyndon LaRouche has actually been fighting a very, very similar fight. And um, Plato waged this fight with the same weapons that LaRouche is waging the fight now. That is, how does the human being know the universe? 
How do we know that we're different from animals? How can we prove that we're different from animals? How can we therefore organize a society based on ideas which differentiate us from animals? Uh, how do we use the ideas which human beings can uniquely discover, discoveries of universal principle, of how the universe functions? How can you then put that to work to provide a better material base for your society, to foster this progress and so on? Uh, Plato's, um, Plato and the uh, group that he worked with uh, most of his closest political collaborators, as we'll see, Archytas, Eudoxus, uh, and others, these were political fighters. Uh, and they were also some of the greatest mathematicians, geometers, and scientists of all time. As many people here know, Archytas' discovery of how you double the area of a cube of, uh, huh? Volume. <laughs> is uh, double the volume of a cube is, you know, is one of the greatest uh, breakthroughs in all of, of human, human knowledge in terms of what it represents. Archytas was also a general, and he was one of the people who led his city of Tarentum uh, throughout most of his adult and political life, and he was a close collaborator of Plato, which I'll come back to. But these are people who are passionately involved in both the political battle and in the profound pursuit of discovery of new universal physical principles. So what we're doing today, what the LaRouche Youth Movement do, is doing today in terms of waging this political battle against the forces of bestiality, but waging it with these ideas has got an absolutely extraordinary tradition going back to, going back to Plato. Um, now to locate uh, the years prior to Plato's political activity, which uh, some of you know. Uh, I'll have an article in the upcoming Fidelio, which also goes through, through this, so in a month or so people will have access to it in, in writing. But Greece, in the period between 490 BC and, uh, about, and 432 BC, this is the period just prior to Plato's birth, was the major force in the world uh, with help from Egypt when it wasn't under the thumb of the Persians, uh, was the major force in the world standing up to the Persians, standing up to the Persian Empire. Uh, however, Greece was subverted from within, somewhat like the United States. We were the major force in the world that defeated fascism in World War II, and then we've allowed ourselves to be subverted from within. So, you know, as the old Pogo comic strip has it, we have met the enemy and he are us. Uh, we've become the fascists. Uh, because we were subverted from within. And the same thing happened to Athens especially, Greece in general, but Athens in particular. Uh, enemy ideas, the Eleatics, the Sophists, and so on, people who argued that either there is no truth or you can't know the truth. So whoever's got the biggest stick wins, or who, you know, whoever wields the biggest nuclear weapon. You know, this was Harry Truman's policy at the end of World War II. We got the nuclear weapons, so you do what we say. It's Dick Cheney's policy. We have the nuclear weapons, you do what we say. Forget about justice, forget about principles, might makes right. These ideas took over Athens uh, in the period just prior to Plato's birth and manipulated Athens and Sparta into fighting the Peloponnesian War, which went on from 432 B.C. to 404 B.C. They created a civil war within Greece. The, the, the Persians operating from the outside created a civil war inside Greece, so it was let's you and him fight. And Athens was completely destroyed. Uh, they had a plague which wiped very early in this war, which wiped out, a, it was a horrible plague, um, and it went on for years and years, several years. It kept coming back. It was, people would go mad in the process of dying from this plague and so on. Uh, you had population reduction, starvation, constant uh, insane military adventures which kept failing and so on. You had a society which went completely crazy. And Plato was growing up during this. He's born in 427. You're in the height of the insane actions of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta during this entire period of time. And just three years prior to the war's end, Plato meets Socrates in 407 BC. And so he's with Socrates in the, in the last eight years of Socrates' life. 
and then Athens being as completely insane as it was uh, executed Socrates because he dared to teach the young people of Athens how to search for the truth uh, and Plato as he recounts in his famous seventh letter which I'll come back to talks about how the execution of Socrates changed his entire intention for his life Plato came from a very political family um, his mother came from a long political line in fact she could actually trace her lineage back to Solon of Athens uh, his, his uncles and his cousins and his brothers were political and he intended to be political he intended to enter Athenian political life and so on and with the, with the execution of Socrates he said no I'm not going to do that because you could see within the axiomatic framework of politics there was no chance to change anything that you had to bring a new principle to bear on the degeneration of Athens. It's like today. If you're in the framework of politics, media, money, playing to the public opinion of the 25% of the voters who vote and so on, you can't change anything. Rouge is not going to change anything from within that, that framework. We're not going to get the media. We're not going to get $100 million. And we're not going to change the minds of most of the people in the upper 20% of the income brackets who happen to be the people who are voting. So within the domain of, of politics as usual, we're going to lose. What, is, what has LaRouche done? He's created a new political force, a new political principle, a youth movement based on ideas which can inspire the 80% in the lower income brackets who've given up, who stopped voting. So it's not going to be within politics as usual that Lynn wins the 2004 presidential election. It's because of the power of ideas which he has been able to develop and communicate to this growing youth movement which can then communicate it to a much larger constituency of the have-nots of the forgotten man and woman which is going to break the axioms of politics and Plato knew he had to do something outside of the axioms of politics so he, he abandoned whatever intentions he had to play Athenian politics uh, and the first thing he did is he embarked on extensive travel. Uh, uh, in fact, most of Socrates' close collaborators got out of Dodge after Socrates was executed. Uh, they went to various parts of uh, Greece, uh, and, but Plato engaged in very, very, very extensive travels for about 11 years uh, after Socrates died. He. Um, first place he went was is, these are from not contemporary sources but ancient sources and while uh, every particular may not be exactly accurate the overall uh, picture that's painted by these ancient sources uh, is coherent with what we know about Plato so uh, the first place he went was in what is now Libya a place called Cyrene which is a Greek colony uh, which had been settled for three or four hundred <coughs> years prior to it. And Cyrene is where uh, the ge geometer Theodorus, whom we meet in the Theotetus dialogue, uh, lives and comes from. But this is the center of a lot of mathematical, geometrical, other kinds of activity. Yeah, Cody? Could you just mark Athens on that? Sure. Uh, it's about here. Sparta. Sparta is Spar the reason it's called the Peloponnesian anyone know why it's called the Peloponnesian War Athens and Sparta the island uh, close but it's not an island who oh. said the peninsula. the peninsula yeah this peninsula is the Peloponnese so that's why it's called the Peloponnesian War because they're fighting there um, there's Sparta we're going to get actually we need Sicily we'll get to that later um, it's not round. I could have my friend come back and actually draw Sicily. <laughs> uh, so he goes to Cyrene, which is a, uh, which again is a center of mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and so on. Uh, and it's been in a long dialogue with Egypt, which I'll come to in a minute. But it's largely a Greek city in Cyrene. Um, then from there, he apparently travels up to Italy to. Uh, not really clear where, somewhere in the boot uh, of Italy. And there he meets 
with the what is left of the Pythagorean community. Uh, the Pythagoreans had been almost physically wiped out about 500 BC by their enemies. This is 100 years later, and this is what's left of them, although it's what, what's left of them is very significant. Uh, and the Pythagoreans that he probably meets with in this trip are Philolaus, Mike. Mike is doing some work on Philolaus. Um, and Echecrates and a few other people that I don't know there's much extant about. But then from there, he travels down to Egypt. So let's see, where are we going to put Egypt? Let's try and get it sort of in the right place. Okay, let's call this the Nile. Um, and from there he goes, he travels to Egypt. Uh, now, Egypt has been, let's make it look like the Nile. There, that's the Delta. Um, as LaRouche said in his, uh, in his webcast and has referenced on many occasions, the activities of Plato and earlier before them, Solon, Thales, and especially Pythagoras, this is in the shadow of the pyramids. I mean, this is in the shadow of Egypt. The, the concept of looking at the universe from the standpoint of discovering principles which you can learn especially from astronomy, or to put it negatively, the principle of looking at the universe not linearly, looking at spherics, discovering all of the paradoxes that you find in trying to map the heavenly bodies, in dealing with the incommensurable difference between curves and straight lines and so on. This is a tradition which goes back in Egypt. We're in 400 BC with Plato, at least 2,500 years, probably 10,000 years. In fact, Plato's Timaeus, of course, has um, Solon of Athens, Plato's mother's great, 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 great something or other, Solon of Athens going to Egypt in s around 600 BC and being told by the Egyptian priests in the Temple of Ammon that the Greeks are children, they know nothing about ancient ways, and then he tells the story of Egypt and Greece going back to about 10,000 BC, uh, 9,000 years earlier, and so on. And as I've discussed in other classes uh, and other people are looking at, if you actually look at the astronomical implications of the Great Pyramids, which were built around 2600 BC, you're dealing with a culture which was grappling with these ideas for a long, long time. So Pythagoras, Solon, Thales, Socrates, Plato are standing on the shoulders of people whose names we don't know and probably will never know. Uh, there's not a lot of extant writings and texts. You have to sort of know what they had to understand about the universe by studying what the pyramids actually are as astronomical observatories, as representations of complex motions in the sky, and so on and so forth. So for Plato to go to Egypt and apparently spent a fair amount of time there, uh, undoubtedly you know, he's meeting with these scientists, these geometers. Many of them are in the Temple of Ammon. The Temple of Ammon had been, in a sense, the repository of this knowledge. I mean, remember, we are in 400 BC. It's not like you've got mass public education. You know, these ideas are not something which is going out to everybody. There's usually a fairly small group of people who are able to pass this knowledge on from generation to generation. And the other thing about Egypt is outside of, you know, certain tablets, the pyramid texts, and so on, you've got very, very little in writing, you know, from this earlier period. So these ideas were passed on orally. They were passed on in the form of myths, epic poems, and so on. And this is what Plato... <coughs> Uh, uh, undoubtedly met with and worked with in, in Egypt. Uh, there's no question he would have found the Pythagorean community in Egypt because Pythagoras, like Plato, had spent a long time in Egypt and, the, and very much the basis of Pythagoras' concepts of harmony and geometry and astronomy and so on came from the Egyptians as well. So Plato spends uh, quite some time in Egypt and uh, then he... Then he then in about 388, he returns to Athens. Do so you know how long he was in Egypt? It's hard. You, you can, we can't really tell. I mean, somewhere in this, I mean, he did a lot of traveling. I mean, for, if if the ancient source that this is from, Diogenes Laertes, is right, first he goes here, then he goes here, then he goes there. 
And then he goes back to Athens, and then very shortly after that, he goes back to Italy. And, uh, and this is in uh, 388, 388, 387, and this is crucial. He goes to two places. First, he goes to Tarentum, which is right here. goes to Syracuse. Now, Tarentum is probably one of the defining, outside of Socrates' death, Tarentum is, the visit to Tarentum is probably one of the defining moments of his life, because this is where he strikes up a lifelong friendship with Archytas, uh, who's about his age. Uh, they seem to be pretty much uh, contemporary. And uh, Archytas was I guess you could call him the third generation after, uh, of the Pythagoreans. Um, Philolaus was sort of like the link. Philolaus was Archytas' teacher. Uh, and as I said before, Archytas was not some you know, ivory tower intellectual. Uh, he was a general. He was one of the leaders of Tarentum. Uh, he engaged in extensive diplomacy throughout the region. And um, as we'll see, worked very, very closely with Plato in terms of Plato's political efforts to establish new forces that would be able to combat the Persians. Now, to give you, to just locate historically where the fight against the Persians stands at this point, I mean, remember, the Persians have succeeded in the Peloponnesian War, so they got Spartan and Athens to bleed each other for 32 years. Uh, Various forces, anti-Persian forces associated with Plato, nonetheless kept trying to do something to get rid of the Persians. And for those of you who've read um, Xenophon's Anabasis, The March of the Ten Thousand, this is about an effort in 404, 404 BC, I think. Yeah, 404 BC, 10,000 Greeks with the brother of the Persian king march over to Persia in attempt to overthrow the Persian king. Uh, his brother was ready to carry out an insurrection. So he had 10,000 Greeks, uh, uh, which included Xenophon, in an effort to do that. They won the key battle, but the king's brother was a macho and decided to fight hand-to-hand -hand combat with his brother and got himself killed. So there's 10,000 Greeks stranded way behind Persian lines with no leadership, you know, and their effort to replace the Persian king with his brother, who would be friendly to Greece, you know, fell apart, and they had to get out of there, which is what the March of the 10,000 is. So that was an effort in 404, which fell a little bit short. Um, there were, uh, then in 396, uh, again, Plato will be out of the country, out of Athens at this time, uh, a new capability arises, and it's ironic, it's the uh, person who takes over Sparta, uh, uh, Agesilaus, or Agesilaus, however it would be pronounced, Agesilaus, I guess it would be pronounced. Uh, and for, for uh, uh, reasons which would probably have to be investigated a little more histor historically, you end up with a good guy as the head of Sparta. Uh, he sort of, somebody outmaneuvers somebody, and you end up with somebody who's willing to fight the Persians. So in 396, he leads another group of people over to Persia, another 10,000 people and so on, to try and defeat the Persians. And in the meantime, the Persians are mucking around back in Sparta, and they create an insurrection, so he's got to go back and put the insurrection down in Sparta and so on. But all of these are efforts. I mean, nobody has given up on this idea of defeating the Persians. You know, it's like LaRouche throughout this entire 30, 40 year period of time, you know, n never having the actual power at any point to defeat the financial oligarchy, but constantly looking for new ways to go at them, launching battles which can weaken them, maybe one of them will win, you know, and so on and so forth. That's what these forces are doing throughout this entire period. So Pla one of the reasons Plato then goes to Syracuse is since all these other efforts have failed, although Agesilaus stays in the fight and carries out a couple of other efforts against the Persians, it's clear they need to develop some new capabilities, something that's not going to constantly be undermined by Persian subversion, by sophistry, and so on. So what Plato does is he goes to Syracuse to try and recruit a philosopher king. <laughs> 
to try and recruit the leader of Syracuse, who's named Dionysius I, uh, and then we will meet Dionysius II, uh, to try and recruit <coughs> Dionysius I to Plato's outlook and Plato's ideas. And um, uh, he... He, while he's while he's there, he meets Dionysius the first's brother-in-law Dion. I'll write that. Uh, who ends up being so we got Dionysius the first. It took me a long time to get these guys straight. You have his brother-in-law Dion, and then you have his son. Guess what? Dionysius the second. So for the next 40 years of Plato's life, these guys and Archytas uh, play, play a fundamental role because this is the area where Plato is really endeavoring to establish a political base of operations. Did you have your hand up, John? Yeah. It's uh, the name of a wacky god. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it does. I don't know if it does. I think it's just an actual. I mean, maybe somewhere it means something, but I don't. It's not like, it's not like um, Socrates, which means the power of wisdom. I, I don't think it's made of those kind of components. Yeah, Scott. Um, Dion is the brother-in-law. Of Dionysius yeah, he's the brother-in-law of Dionysius the first, and so he's the uncle of Dionysius the second. And uh, again, it's, it's, it's fun to get the generations. So Plato has gone to Syracuse for the first time in 388, 387. So he's, Plato is 40 years old. He meets Dion, who's 20 years old. And Dion becomes one of his key protégés, which we'll see as this develops. So, so do you know why yeah. he chose uh, Syracuse? It was a very uh, rich, powerful... Greek city uh, and there's more that could be done on this whole history in terms of uh, in terms of answering that question more fully but I think it's sort of like the Renaissance forces colonizing the Americas you know Greece was just the operations were just too firmly in place in Greece and this was a Greek speaking economically powerful city uh, there were Greek-speaking cities here. You had Cyrene here. So you could assume that Plato and his forces were looking for a flank which was not, you know, which was not so much under the control of all these Persian operations. Because, I mean, they were running operation after operation here. You know, Egypt uh, was under uh, Persian domination throughout most of this period. Every so often they'd throw the Persians off. But they, you know, they were pretty much dominated by this period of time. So it's kind of like, okay, the feudal oligarchy is running Europe. We got to build something in, you know, on, in in the Western Hemisphere, which will be less contaminated, and which can more rapidly develop these these ideas. Mike. That's a quick question. On <coughs> when did the Persians come into Egypt? When? Yeah. They conquered Egypt the first time back around, or well, might not have been the first time. Yeah, I think it was the first time. About 570 B.C. Prior to that, the Egyptians had been conquered by the Babylonians, and prior to that, they'd been conquered by the Assyrians. So from about 900, 800 B.C., Egypt kept getting conquered. I mean, they, they were militarily being suppressed by bad guys throughout this entire period of time. There was a brief period uh, around the time of uh, Pythagoras when Egypt um, uh, liberated itself from the, from the Egyptians. This is under the pharaoh Amasis. Amasis, by the way, married a Greek from Cyrene. That's how much he loved the Greeks. Uh, and worked very closely with um, various political forces, probably Pythagoras among others, uh, in trying to free the whole Mediterranean. But when he died in about about 530 BC, his son took over and he just wasn't up to the job. And within another two or three years, uh, Egypt was back under Persian control. So there were a few brief times, a couple of years here, a couple of years there, where the Egyptians threw the Persians off, but they were pretty much totally militarily conquered throughout this entire period of time. <coughs> 
So, uh, so what Plato is looking for, because of the strategic importance of Syracuse, is somebody that he can recruit to the idea of governing, not from the standpoint of tyranny and might ra makes right, but governing from the standpoint of universal principles. And, um, but he's up against, uh, he's up against the sophists. There are sophists in Dionysius's court. To one in particular named Philistus and another one named Aristippus, and these guys were constantly poisoning the well. So after um, uh, uh, after about a year in Syracuse, this is the first time where Plato's life is in danger. Uh, he's seized by Dionysius the first, and he's about to be sold into slavery. You know, and that's the last we would have heard of this guy. Uh, uh, what happened is Dion, who had become his young protege, uh, helped intervene. They found a Greek from Cyrene who would pay the ransom and get Plato out of captivity and send him back to Athens. Now, as the story has it, um, some of Plato's friends, when he got back to Athens, then wanted to pay this guy back for having paid the ransom. And the guy said, no, keep the money and found your academy. So that's the story the ancient, ancient historians have said, that the money that, that bought the land that created Plato's academy came as a result of the person who saved his life then donating the money instead of asking for it back. So this is when Plato comes back and founds the academy. Uh, so his first trip Trip one is 388 to 387. Founds the academy in 387. Now, it's clear that his visit, his his work with the Pythagoreans, both when he went to. Uh, Italy the first time and met with Philolaus. Undoubtedly, there were Pythagoreans that he met with in Cyrene, in Egypt, and then most fundamentally, Archytas, really represented a fundamental change. Now, one of the things I'll maybe figure out in the next 10 years is when Plato actually wrote his dialogues. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not like he dated them. You know, it's not like on the <coughs> bottom of the foreword. You know, it says January 15th, 387 BC. Um, and there's very few of them where you can actually tell from the internal content of the dialogue when he wrote it. We've discussed in previous classes, the dialogues are set dramatically in an earlier period of time to show the unfolding tragedy of Athens largely during the Peloponnesian War. But when he actually wrote them is not at all clear. But the one thing you can, s you, you, you can see that there's certainly at least two uh, characteristics, sets of dialogues. There are the early dialogues which are very much about the life of Plato, or, or like the life of Socrates, the death of Socrates and so on, where Socrates' method of drawing people to know that they don't know, to get them to constantly confront the paradoxes, you know, to challenge the axiomatic thinking that people had. You know, y you can tell from reading the Apology, the Credo, um, uh, <coughs> maybe not the Phaedo, that may have come later. But there's, there's an earlier set of di dialogues which, just from reading them, you, you could describe them as Socratic. But I don't think there's any question that after he met Archytas, you get an added dimensionality to his dialogues. You begin to see the Pythagorean thinking in the dialogues, in the Republic, uh, in the Theotetus, uh, uh, later on in the, t the Timaeus, which is prob probably later, in the laws and so on, in the, in the Epinomis. I mean, the, the introduction of the ideas of the Pythagoreans erupts, in a sense, after his visit, after his, his, his meeting with Archytas. Uh, Cicero, who we all know from Julius Caesar, um, uh, who was the Greek speaker among the Romans, Cicero apparently wrote that Plato's visit to Archytas was one of the defining moments of his life, and that it was from Archytas that he began to explore uh, questions of number, geometry, ha harmony, astronomy, and the question of the immortality of the soul. <coughs>
which was the Pythagorean doctrine, which is why I think the Phaedo might not be with the earlier Socratic dialogues because its subject is the immortality of the soul. Now, there's been a lot of stuff written about when these dialogues were written. One of the wackiest ones is somebody examines it grammatically and discovers that there's changes in grammatical style, and therefore that must date when certain dialogues were written. I mean, our friend uh, Leo Strauss would get off on that unquestionably. But I think the only way to answer it is, you know, is, is to immerse yourself in the dialogues conceptually, uh, compositionally, and historically. And, you know, I'm sure we can, over time, come with a much more useful approach to when they were written. So, but, uh, and, and so this, this had a, an enormous impact in terms of what Plato was doing in founding the Academy, because it's right after this, this first trip where he meets with Archytas, uh, that he comes back and he founds the Academy. Now, one of the ancient historians said that one of the things that Plato, the problem that Plato would pose to all the uh, people in the Academy, was, all the serious students in the Academy, <coughs> was what is the simplest mathematical formula for the motions of the heavenly bodies which are consistent with the observable phenomenon? So right there you've got, you know, the seed crystal of ultimately the Kepler problem. Uh, but that is what he would pose to every serious student. Now, if you look at, you know, who the members of the academy are, I mean, it's really, it's really breathtaking. And I think the LaRouche Youth Movement is probably in a unique position to look at through the eyes of Gauss, through the eyes of Kepler, through the eyes, through the work that we've done, that you've done, uh, go back now and look at the members of Plato's Academy and the work that they were doing, you know, and see what an incredible uh, foundation there was. It's hardly said. Frankly, if, this, if Plato had won and this hadn't been crushed, you know, we would be having this class right now in another solar system, at least. Galaxy, maybe. I don't know. Uh, because the, 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 the breakthroughs which were squashed for nearly 2,000 years, 1,600 years, and that you know it's a constant battle over the past 400, 500 years to develop these ideas further, to exert greater power over nature. I mean, the seed crystal is all there. So, I mean, here's some of the more prominent people who were in the academy. Uh, Eudoxus. Now, again, Eudoxus, like Archytas, ain't no ivory tower intellectual. He is all over this region organizing all kinds of conspiracies uh, against the Persians. Uh, he's with Plato in Egypt um, the first time Plato was there. Then later on we'll find him in Egypt <coughs> helping work with the Egyptians in one of the new offensives against the Persians and so on. Uh, when Plato goes back to Syracuse the second time, which we haven't gotten to yet, he takes over the academy while Plato is gone. And um, uh, now, among the things, and I haven't studied these guys, so I was just sort of pulling out a dictionary of Greece. So, you know, this is not meant to be conceptual, but just to give you an idea of the kinds of things which uh, Eudoxus was working on. And again, these are the kinds of things we should just sink our teeth into and look at this as an entire curriculum that these guys were working on. He... Um, he apparently proved that, uh, showed that the Earth was round, was spherical, uh, by proving, by showing that the altitude of stars changes at different latitudes. So, you know, if you're a globe and you're here, the North Star is going to be at one altitude, and if you're here, the North Star is going to be at another altitude. So, he proved that. He uh, he did a lot of work with spherics. He improved the approximate length of the year, um, and. Uh, uh, he's famous for the method of exhaustion, uh, of carrying an argument through to the point of exhaustion, but, but prov proving, get, getting you to the point essentially of a singularity. Uh, why, with is, why is Eratosthenes more famous than Eudoxus? Well, he's later, um, I don't know um, why he's more famous. Although he's in this tradition. I mean, he's just, what, two, 200 or 300 years later? Yeah. Uh, one of the other people in the academy is our friend Theotetus, for whom the dialogue is named. Uh, and he was described in this little gloss as the father of solid geometry, 
As we know, he developed a general theory of incommensurability, which is what the Theotetus Dialogue is about. And apparently, he answered Plato's question about coming up with a formula to represent the observable motion of the heavenly bodies through some kind of uh, theory of concentric circles. So, so he's there. Uh, then you have a guy named Heraclides of Pontus, uh, and it is he may have discovered the axial revolution of the Earth. I mean, so much for the flat Earth stuff, right? Uh, and also the revolu did some kind of mapping of the revolutions of Venus and Mars. Uh, and then you have Menechmus, uh, who is the father of conic sections. And he was a, he was a pupil of, our, of, of Eudoxus. And we'll see him a little bit later because he is the tutor of Alexander the Great. Uh, forget this stuff about Aristotle. Alexander the Great was deployed by these guys. So um, this is the academy. I mean, I'm sure there's more to it than this. But to actually look at the body of work that these guys are working on, again, in the middle of a complete political battle, because throughout this period of time, there are various efforts to flank the Persians, defeat the Persians. Apparently, Plato tries to get D Dionysius I uh, to launch an attack on the Oracle of Delphi, <laughs> the bad guys. Delphi is about here. And uh, he's trying to get Dionysius I to settle this area and from there be able to physically attack the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle of Delphi is sort of like the uh, Fox News of the day. Uh, you know, that plus the CNN public opinion polls. <laughs> it was the way that the, the Persians would uh, uh, use uh, oracles and predictions and so on to manipulate people in Greece. So it was, and it was a main base of operations for the Persians the whole time. So Plato tried to get Dionysius I to uh, take on Delphi. That apparently didn't work. So the next, so Plato was busy for 20 years launching the academy. Then he takes his second trip in 367, back to Syracuse, because Dionysius I has died, uh, and um, and obviously never measured up to what Plato wanted. Dion, who has become really quite an avid, had, had become a real protege of Plato in terms of philosophy and um, uh, this world view, Dion urged him to come back because he thought there was a chance that Dionysius II, the son, could actually be educated in philosophy, could actually become the kind of philosopher king that they wanted. So by this time, uh, Plato is uh, 60, Dion is 40, and Dionysius II is 20. And he's just become the head of Syracuse. Uh, but unfortunately, once again, there are um, uh, the sophists are hard at work, and within a couple of months of Plato showing up in Syracuse, they orchestrate the expulsion of Dion. So he's not he's not he's not there any longer, and uh, Dionysius is very young, very much into the pleasures of being the leader of Syracuse. The Syracusan table, the Syracusan banquet, was known as the most completely lavish, over-the-top lifestyle, you know, that you could possibly have. It was quite Dionysian. Huh? It was quite Dionysian. It was quite Dionysian. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was. So um, uh, now, Plato stays behind after Dionysius is expelled for a while because he's really uh, after Dion is expelled because he is really working to somehow recruit Dionysius II. He's also asking Dionysius II to provide him with land and settlers someplace in the land area which is controlled by Dionysius II so he can actually go found a colony all by himself you know, with people and actually put these ideas to work. Frankly, if you read the laws, which is a discussion of a constitution for colonists, you know, it unquestionably was something on Plato's mind for a long time. Um, but ultimately, once again, the sophists. Yeah, Mike. You're saying that this time Dionysius II was a king. Yeah, and by this time he's he's now the king. That's. Did you say that was uh, the the nephew of Dion? Uh, yeah. Okay. It's his son and his nephew. Okay. okay. 
Uncle Dion. <laughs> the first time I read Plato's letters, which is a lot of the letters are, e are to Dionysius II, and they're about Dion and so on. I mean, I read them at least three times before I finally straightened out who was who. Uh, so we'll call him Uncle Dion. That might help. Um, so, uh, so, so after Dion is expelled, Plato sticks around for a while, tries to do some works with Dionysius II, and finally uh, realizes it's it's not going to happen, you know, on the ground there, and he returns to Athens in uh, 366. So the second trip lasts. 366. But he doesn't give up hope. Now, Dion is now with him at the academy in Athens, but he is still working to somehow recruit Dionysius II to the philosophic way of life and so on. And this is what some of the letters uh, uh, that, that we have. Um, I mean, just to get you an idea, this is a letter that he sent to Dionysius II probably in around 365, so it's not too long after he came back. Uh, so he says... Um, uh, you keep saying that you want to learn the benefits of philosophy, uh, so by way of helping towards this end, I am now sending you some of the Pythagorean works and of the divisions, which is diuresius, which is the, uh, in the little interval in the harmonies that, that you get in harmony. Diuresius basically means you're looking at the harmonies. Um, I'm now sending you some of the Pythagorean works and of the divisions, and also... We arranged at that time a man whom you and Archytas may be able to use. And he says, I think Archytas is now coming to your court because he arranged essentially uh, for a growing liaison between Archytas and Dionysius, hoping that Archytas is going to be a good influence on Dionysius II. Uh, his name is Helicon. He is a pupil of Eudoxus, and he is exceedingly well-versed in all of these doctrines. Uh, it were best if you have any leisure at all to take lessons from him in addition to your other studies in philosophy. But if not, get someone else thoroughly taught so that you may learn from him when you have leisure and thereby make progress. Uh, he also sends him a statue, uh, a sculpture, which is done by a pupil of Scopus, Scopus and Praxiteles that Ted has done classes on. Uh, and then he concludes this letter. This is very funny in terms of the translation. Keep well and study philosophy and exhort thereto all the other young men and greet for me your comrades in the game of ball. So then you read the footnote or you look at the Greek. The Greek word which they, they translate as game of ball is literally fellow spherists, <laughs> which as the footnote says could mean fellow astronomers. <laughs> but this thing is being, you know, presented, you know, you know, greet for me, you know, your second baseman. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, but this is what he's trying to, you know, he's 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 doing everything he possibly can to uh, educate Dionysius. And uh, here's another letter uh, where he says, "I've sent you a celestial globe." but there's something wrong with it. So when Archidemus, who's a Pythagorean, gets there, he's going to explain to you what's wrong with it. And he also references at that point that Plato's nephew, uh, 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 Spusippus, is in Syracuse at the time, also working, trying to work on Dionysius and so on. So um, uh, let's see, is this him? Yeah. This is another letter he writes where he says, um, keep up, here's another translation trick. Keep up your education in land measuring. <laughs> now, Danny, what's land measuring? Geometry. Great. Yeah. <laughs> keep up your education in geometry, but it's geometro, geometros, or metron, which can be translated as land measuring, but he's obviously not telling him to be a surveyor. He's telling him to keep up your education in geometry. The guys who did these translations don't really want you to know what he's trying to do. Um, so uh, so he's, he's continuing again in this period. Uh, now, during the same period of time, um, Eudoxus from the since Plato is now back in Athens and Eudoxus doesn't have to run the academy, Eudoxus goes back to Egypt and is working with the Egyptian pharaoh because during the period of time from three, 
366, which is just about when Plato's gotten back, through 361, there's what's called the revolt of the satraps. Essentially, the, con the, the countries which have been conquered by the, uh, the Persians at various times carry out revolts against them. And it's another opportunity, maybe, to defeat the Persians. So you have revolts among some of these countries, and then Egypt successfully revolts against the Persians briefly. And you have Agasileus of Sparta ready to lead another expedition against the Persians, and the Egyptians are sending them <laughs> grain and ships and all sorts of other stuff to try and mobilize once again against the Persians. But the revolt collapses by about 361. Uh, but all of you know this Plato network is pretty much involved in another attempt to to defeat the um, to defeat the Persians. Now, Dion is still in exile. Dionysius II is coming under more and more bad influences, and he's selling Dionysius uh, he's selling Dion's property. He's marrying Dion's wife off, whom he kept captive to somebody else. Uh, and so on. And Plato is constantly trying to intervene with Dionysius II to treat Dion fairly. So finally in 362, uh, Dionysius II keeps saying, look, I really, really, really do want to study philosophy now. Really, this time I'll be serious. So please come back because I really want to study philosophy. Uh, and if you come back, I'll settle all of Dion's affairs and I'll make it right with Dion and so on. Archytas is also very, very much encouraging Plato to go back and see what he can do with Dionysius II uh, because obviously the, he, he, he saw that there was a, a strategic importance to still somehow developing this guy into being an ally that could be deployed against the Persians. Plato really doesn't want to go back the third time. I mean, you, you see this in his seventh letter where he describes this entire process. But he basically says, for the sake of my friend Dion, and if I've got one last chance to make a philosopher king, even though I think I'm working with pretty weak material, you know, I'm going to make one more effort uh, to go back. And um, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the trip, which is a complete disaster pretty much from beginning to end. I mean, as soon as he gets there... The court intrigues start again. The sophists are whipping up all sorts of stories about Plato and so on. And in a fairly short time, he's held captive now by Dionysius II. Uh, and he's in grave danger because there's mobs and they're being whipped up about how Plato is trying to undermine Dionysius II and so on and so forth. And his life was very much in danger. And uh, this is the time when Archytas intervenes to save Plato's life. So Archytas writes a letter to Dionysius II uh, urging him to release him. Uh, and he says, um, Archytas to Dionysius, we, being all of us the friends of Plato, have sent to you uh, Lamiscus and Photetus in order to take the philosopher away by the terms of the agreement made with you. You will do well to remember the zeal with which you urged us all to secure Plato's coming to Sicily. Hmm. Determined as you were to persuade him and to undertake, amongst other things, responsibility for his safety, so long as he stayed with you. Remember this, too, that you set great store in his coming, and from that time had more regard for him than for any of those in your court. Uh, but if he has given you any offense, it behooves you to behave with humanity and restore him to us unhurt. By doing so, you will satisfy justice and at the same time put us under your obligation. And that is sufficient to get Dionysius II to release Plato. And he leaves Sicily for the last time uh, and goes back to Athens. Um, uh, he, however, still is corresponding with Dionysius II. He's still trying. And he writes a letter to him in um, three... 357, uh, in which he discusses with him the question of governing Sicily. And this is really uh, uh, probably a precursor to what he writes in the laws, if we can presume that the laws were the last thing he wrote. Uh, this, is ten, this will be 10 years before Plato's death. He's now 70 years old in 357. So he writes to Dionysius II again and said, and first of all said, look, I'm tired of the false accusations of these sophist philosophers against me. I'm not plotting against you. I'm trying to get you to be a good ruler. Um, and then he says, um, he said, you yourself know for certain that I willingly took part in a f some few of your political acts at first. 
when I thought that I was doing some good by it, and that I gave a fair amount of attention to the prelude of the laws, besides other small matters, apart from additions in writings made by you and anything else. For I'm told that some of you afterwards revised my preludes. Now this is a, a, an early echo of what Plato does in the laws, which is beautiful. You know, you get through about six books of the laws, and he's going through detail after detail about how you Who's, who's the judges, how you divide up the land, you know, very, very detailed. But halfway through this thing, he goes, but wait a minute, we've forgotten something in our constitution that we're, these details that we're going through. We've forgotten the prelude. We've forgotten the preamble, basically. And he says, the prelude must embody the idea of the good, that you're governing your society for the purpose of doing good. So here he's, I'm sure that's what was embodied in the prelude that he wrote for Dionysius II, but it looks like they monkeyed with it. But, you know, in 357, he's still trying to organize this guy. But finally, in a sense, enough is enough. And I'm not sure if this was Plato's idea or whether Dion couldn't take it any longer uh, or what. I, I suspect Plato was, was very much uh, in keeping with this. And in 350, uh, 350 <coughs> probably right after Plato writes this letter, Dion raises a small army and goes back to Syracuse. He actually bounces all around, picking up uh, soldiers here and some from, some, some from other parts of Syracuse and so on. But Dion finally goes back to Syracuse to overthrow Dionysius II because they've pretty much given up that they're going to be able to do anything with this guy. And Dion does succeed in overthrowing Dionysius II. But what happens is very much like the tragedy of Athens earlier. The population of Syracuse can just be whipped up by the sophists, uh, you know, by the public opinion polls at the drop of a hat. So Dion gets thrown out twice by the mob, which is crazy, and then things go to hell and they get much worse, and then they bring him back again, and then the mob whips them up again, and so on and so forth, uh, and they throw him out, and he's finally back in there for the third time when he's assassinated uh, in 354. So he's back here from 357 to 354 uh, and uh, makes some progress, but then ultimately gets assassinated. And this is a huge blow to Plato. Um, he writes an epitaph for him, uh, which is recorded, and so on. Um, but uh, uh, he, uh, and it's after that, after Dion's assassination, that Plato writes his seventh letter, which I'll come back to in a minute, uh, which is really, which, which describes from Plato, in Plato's own words, the entire history of his efforts to intervene into Sicily and turn this into a government which will actually serve the general welfare. Now, Plato dies, uh, let me write down, uh, Dion dies, what did I say, 54. Plato lives for another seven years. But right in between here, somebody is born. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is born somewhere right in here. Uh, and ends up coming under the tutelage. Actually, she's born in 350. Well, actually, she's born right here, 356. Um, and comes under the tutelage of Plato's Academy. Uh, you know, the, the guys who tell you that, you know, the Kremlin just won again in Russia uh, will also tell you that Alexander is uh, was treated was trained by Aristotle. Uh uh. Aristotle was a friend of his father's. Aristotle was probably brought in to brainwash him. But Alexander's real education was from people from Plato's Academy. And Alexander picked up where they left off. And by 334, when he was only 22 years old, he launches his famous ex exhibition against expedition against Persia. <coughs> and over the course of the next um, 11 years succeeds in smashing Persia, destroying you know, their control over this entire area, returns to Egypt, liberates Egypt. Now, besides the platonic influence on Alexander the Great, his mother was a priestess uh, in the temple of Dodona, 
which is up about here, which is the sister temple to the temple of Ammon in Egypt. So you have that input into Alexander as well. So, you know, again, you've got an entire... What, what you have from these, these various forces is the characteristic of anti-oligarchism, whether it's coming from the Temple of Ammon in Egypt or Plato's Academy uh, and so on. And uh, uh, Alexander is himself assassinated in 323, and the gains he makes begin to be rolled back. Uh, and as Harley mentioned, really sort of the final blow to this battle of the Greek classical thinkers and statesmen and so on is the assassination of Archimedes back in Syracuse in 200, anybody know? 12. 212. 212 B.C. Uh, and that's really the beginning of a dark age, which doesn't end until the Golden Renaissance. John? Huh? Archimedes. Archimedes, Archimedes who's like, you know, the <coughs> next next generation, you know, after Plato's generation. And you really don't bring Plato's, uh, the ideas of the Greek classical period back to life until you have the Golden Renaissance. And you don't actually ever put it to work in terms of statecraft until we have the American Revolution. Now, uh, which, is where we, which is where we are today. Now, I want to just briefly return to Plato's seventh letter because as I was reading it the other night, which was in the wake of Bruce's class last, not last Sunday. I was reading it about five days after Bruce's class on Kepler and Leibniz and the infinitesimal and so on. There were all sorts of ideas rattling around in my head from the class. And as I was reading the seventh letter, certain things sort of began to gel in, in the sense that you can see the, the, the method of thinking, the problems which are being grappled with over the centuries by Cusa, by, Le by, Kep Kes by Kepler, by Leibniz, and so on, it's clear these ideas exist in seed crystal form in terms of what was going on in the academy. And you can hear, you can hear an echo of it in uh, the discussion in the middle of the seventh letter, which is the only place where you actually have Plato himself, not through the mouth of Socrates, but Plato himself talking about his philosophy and thought process. Now he does it in a very uh, ironical way because it comes in in the letter where he's basically explaining, trying to explain uh, to the world, uh, deal with all the slanders of him in the sense that he was trying to overthrow Dionysius II all along and so on. He says, look, I tried to teach this kid. You know, I tried over and over. Uh, but Dionysius II was not of the, the inclination to live the kind of life you have to live to study philosophy. And he said one example of this is Dionysius II claims that he wrote down a philosophical treatise <coughs> based on my writings. And Plato says this right here proves that he doesn't understand anything I say because you can't write down my doctrine. And what he then goes through is a beautiful pedagogical exercise in terms of how you, how you bring the mind to think in the complex domain, essentially, and that it's not something that you write out in terms of a doctrine. It's not, there's no formula. There's no formula for um, uh, thinking in this way. So what he says is, he says, there does not exist, nor will there ever exist, any treatise of mine dealing with these ideas. For it does not admit of verbal expression like other studies. But as a result of a continued application to the subject itself, and a communion with the subject itself therewith, is brought to birth in the soul on a sudden, as a light that is kindled by a leaping spark, and thereafter it nourishes itself. Now, that was the first clue that I was getting into something pretty interesting because this word, which they tra translate as on a sudden, uh, is actually shows up in uh, the Parmenides at a crucial point. You could translate it as singularity, but actually, <coughs> I think the actual Greek does a pretty good job. It is the suddenly. What Plato actually does is he takes an adverb, which is suddenly, exopnos, and he turns it into a substantive, the suddenly. Uh, 
So he's trying to communicate a kind of verbal action as opposed to just a dead noun. Something happens, you know, which we all know that light bulb turning on in our minds. But it's 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 uh, a, a concept which he then develops. But that 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 is the process of knowledge, puzzling over the paradoxes, developing a higher conception, looking at it from a new new eyes, and so on and so forth. That is the process of actual human knowledge, and it's not something that you're going to write down in a book. You have to cause somebody to experience that intellectual process through, for example, a pedagogical experiment. Um, and he says, um, one of the reasons you don't write this down is because people, people who are lazy will read it without going through the work in their minds, and they will be filled with the mistaken contempt that they had learned some sublime mysteries, you know, which kind of reminds you of the people who read Plato and think it's a formula. You know, think it's a recipe. Well, he says you can do this. He says this is the kind of music you're supposed to like. He says you can't do that, and so on. Who read it literally rather than reading these dialogues as pedagogical exercises. So then he says, however, that being said, I want to try and give you some kind of idea of what I'm talking about. So he then very briefly, in just a couple of pages, develops the following. He says, every existence has three things which are the necessary be means by which knowledge of that object is acquired. And we'll come back to those three. And then he says there's a fourth, which is the knowledge of the object itself, your knowledge of the object. And then there's a fifth, which is <coughs> that which the, actually object is, I don't, I'm falling prey to the translation, existence, the existence of something. It may not be an object, it may be an idea. The fifth thing is the thing itself. There's the knowledge of justice, but there's justice itself. Uh, and, and that's the fifth. But So then he, go, he backs up and he says, okay, but what did I mean by the first three? Okay, the first, thi the first thing you need in knowing an, an idea, an essence, an existence, is you give it a name. So you, you have its name. But you also have its definition. And he's, he uses the example of the circle. The name of a circle is a circle. Uh, the definition of a circle, a definition, could be that which is everywhere equidistant from its extremities to the centers. So that's the definition of the circle. The third thing <coughs> is an image of a circle, like what I did with Syracuse, which isn't a circle, but <laughs> the image of the circle. So you have these three things, which are the first three things, the name, circle, the definition of it, uh, and then an image of it. Now think of it, all of those things sort of dwell in what LaRouche calls, and Plato would call, the visible domain, or the domain of your senses. The image, and you have a name and a description which you're hearing with words, and so on. But what is this fourth thing he says? The fourth thing of this is the knowledge which takes all of these other things, the name, the definition, the image, and so on, and uh, the fourth thing, he says, the fourth, with the fourth comes knowledge and intelligence and true opinion regarding these essences, these uh, existences. And these we must assume to form a single whole, which does not exist in vocal utterance or in bodily forms, but in souls. In other words, the thought object, the idea, is a combination of all of these things and even higher, so that's the fourth. And the fifth, as he said, is the actual existence itself. There is the actual idea of circle, which transcends its name, transcends its definition, transcends an effort to draw it or construct, transcends it physically, and is the circle itself, which is in the invisible domain, which is knowable to the mind. These two the fourth, which is the knowledge of the object, which encompasses these lower things, and then the, the essence itself, these are objects of the mind. So he's, and then he describes, and he says this applies not just to circles, it, it applies to, um, it can, it applies to anything that you, I mean this is, he's going through a, a, a 
working out of what some people call the platonic idea, but it's much better to just work through the idea than give it a name, as he says, because the name kind of makes it status, static. Um, and he says, unless a man somehow or other grasps uh, the four of these, in other words, the name, the definition, the image, and the knowledge, you've got to be playing with the interrelationship of all of those things to come with an idea of what the uh, the the um, existence itself is. So he will, unless you're grappling with these lower orders, you will never perfectly acquire the knowledge of the reality of it itself. Um, and he says the tendency is to uh, think you know it by knowing these lower qualities of definition, its picture, and so on and so forth. But the soul, he says, seeks not to know the quality, but the actual essence of this existence. Um, and he says, uh, each of the four proffers to the soul, either in word or in concrete form, that which the soul isn't looking for. The soul is not looking for something tangible. It's not looking for something which you're going to find in verbs or words or so on. The soul is looking for, to, to use the phrase, thought object. Uh, uh, an idea that the that which universally is the idea you're trying to grapple with, and he says um, uh, too often because of our bad training we're not really looking for this essence. We're satisfied with these lower. We think that when we draw something like this, if I did it with a compass, that that would actually be the essence of circle. It wouldn't be. Uh, and he says. Then he, then he describes the kind of pedagogical exercise that he's asking people to go through. He says, um, the only way you discover the fifth, which is the actual idea or essence itself, is he said, it is the method methodological, no, rather the methodical study of all of these stages, playing with the first four, passing in turn from one to the other, up and down, with which difficulty implants knowledge uh, uh, in a human in humans' minds, and he says, um, uh, in one word. Well, and then he says, he says, uh, he says, for in learning these 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 essences, these ideas, it is necessary to learn at the same time both what is false and what is true of the whole of this existence and that through the most diligent and prolonged investigation, as I said at the commencement, is by means of examination of each of these, comparing one with the other, names and definitions, visions and sense perceptions, proving them by kind, kindly proofs and employing questionings and answerings that are void of envy. Uh, it is by such means, and hardly so, that there are bursts out into the light of intelligence and reason regarding each object in the mind of him. And again, it's this idea of the burst of light, the suddenly, the exopness, this, that which gives you the, the essence of the singularity which defines something. For example, as Bruce was discussing in his class uh, a week ago uh, uh, Sunday, the, 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 the essence of the ellipse is found in its characteristic of motion. It's not drawing ellipse, it's not some definition of ellipse, it's in, in the characteristic which reflects something of a universal principle that defines the ellipse. This is what Plato is struggling to describe here uh, in this definition. And he says um, uh, that Dionysius obviously knows nothing of this, uh, because there's no propensity to struggle with these kinds of ideas in his mind. And he said, um, and once one grapples with this kind of thought object, once you develop this kind of idea of an ellipse, a, a circle, justice, uh, uh, what the other things he describes, he said once you've actually got that thought object, you've had that suddenly in your mind, and you have something which gives you an understanding of the characteristic which generates that, that thing, which defines it, the universal characteristic. He said, there's no fear that you're ever going to forget this. So it's not like you would ever have to go refer to a book again to look up its definition. 
you know, your mind has comprehended a new idea and it's yours. It's become yours. And then he says something which I find completely fascinating. He said, um, uh, for uh, if once one grasps this concept of knowledge with his soul, he sees that it occupies the smallest possible space. Now, when I read that, which was a few days after Bruce's class leading up to the question of the infinitesimal, it seems to me that the whole way that he's developing this, knowing what the academy is engaged in, in terms of questions of harmony, geometry, astronomy, and so on, what he's actually converging on with this idea of the suddenly, this idea that it occupies the smallest space. Uh, by the way, uh, the smallest possible space in Greek <coughs> is the same thing that brachistochrone ber comes from. So the Greek at that point is uh, brachutatos, uh, and so on. That you, you see just the earliest, earliest seed crystal in the work of the academy. In, because they're posing the same problems. They're posing the problem which Kepler is, is struggling with. They're posing the problem which Leibniz solves with his calculus, which is then taken further and so on. They're posing the same problems. So therefore, one would assume that they're thinking in the same way that we know Gauss and Kessner and Kepler and Leibniz and so on were thinking. And I think you see echoes, you see little early shadows of this in this discussion in the seventh letter. I mean, I'd recommend that people actually, you know, look at it and think it through. But also that we, we take a look at the work of the academy from the vantage point that we're at, at right now. Because the more that I look at this, the more it becomes, you know, absolutely extraordinary that this is exactly what Lynn is doing today. Uh, and I, th I don't think that Lynn knew Plato himself as a young man, from what I know from his autobiography, although I've never asked him directly. He came to Plato through Leibniz. So it's not like he read a book about the Academy when he was 12 years old and said, okay, you know, that's what I'm going to do. There's a lawfulness in the universe. If you're trying to think like a human being, if you're trying to discover universal principles, if you're trying to fulfill humanity's purpose on this, this, this globe, and, and off this globe, uh, you're going to end up thinking in the same way. I mean, it's why we know the way the Egyptians thought 5,000 years ago, and we don't have anything in writing to prove it, because we know the ideas they were grappling with. We can see, the, we can see it in the stones in terms of the pyramids and so on. We know what, these, what, what Plato and his academy were working with. We know that his political fight was identical to Lynn's. And I think we can be, we, we, you know, it's, it's somewhat humbling to think that Plato devoted his entire life to this titanic battle, uh, you know, engaged in this political fight day in, day out for 80 years, uh, never, saw a, never saw the success of that. Uh, even the next generation after him saw Alexander temporarily succeed against the Persians, and then that fell apart. And then you have the death of, of um, Archimedes in 212. And you have a dark age which goes on for a millennium and a half. And it's now taken us a half a millennium to get to the point where we can, in essence, stand on these people's shoulders and finally finish the job. The DC primary represents uh, uh, one of those singularities. It represents a suddenly. If we do what we have to do, we're going to shift the characteristic, the characteristic which has been going in the wrong direction since the death of Kennedy, since the ascension of Truman, and so on. That, it, it won't mean the end of the fight, but the way Lynn has conducted his fight for his 80 years is to bring about that change in direction, that change in the essential characteristic of what we're doing, and to use these kinds of powerful ideas as the weapon for actually doing that. So we're four, four weeks minus one day to the DC primary. And it's, for those who have been organizing in Los Angeles for several months, we also know that the D.C. primary isn't coming out of nowhere. Lynn wins the D.C. primary, he wins the presidential campaign, future historians will go back and they will look at January 13th, 2004, in Washington, D.C., as the point where it looks like it came from nowhere. But we know it didn't because we're not in, we wouldn't be in a position to do what we're doing in Washington if we hadn't done what we did in Los Angeles.
and then did in Philadelphia. And we couldn't have done what we did in Los Angeles if Lynn hadn't launched the youth movement three years ago. Mm -hmm. So this, this question of changing the characteristic, the change takes place in a sudden way, but the fight to change sometimes takes decades and decades, or in the case of Plato and his friends, it's taken several millennia to actually do it. We're at the point to finally make that change, and we better not let it slip through our fingers. So here we are, Plato's new academy, uh, ready to finish the job. So, thank you. I must have missed something. Um, in Syracuse, after they assassinate Dion, mm -hmm. how does, and then in between you were talking about Alexander the Great. Right. By the time you have Archimedes, Syracuse becomes essentially the town of Archimedes, and Archimedes is. The I mean, how does that? I don't know the history after that period of time. I mean, did, did Alexander use Syracuse as a base of operations? Was it a primary city in that? Movement? I think the important thing about Syracuse is that it was a Greek city, um, and you know whatever the political. It becomes you know, the last Greek city. It right? becomes the last Greek city. I mean, I think even, even after Dion was assassinated, uh, I think there were probably still further back and forths. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just haven't followed the history past the death of Plato. But I'm sure there were still further back and forths in terms of who was ruling and why it still remained a powerful city and remained a center of learning. Where are you researching this stuff? I mean, how, what's your approach? Like, how are you getting stuff? How, like, what's your process? Like, you, you really... You? Um, First of all, you've got to go to the most ancient texts, uh, and there are some. I mean, Plutarch, even though he was a priest at the Temple of Delphi, so you have to keep that in account, his lives of famous Greeks and Romans, you know, does give you a very, like he's got one of the, uh, one of the lives he does is Dion. Mm -hmm. So you can read about the life of Dion. You have uh, a second or third century actually I remember if it's A.D. or B.C., uh, a historian called Diogenes La Laertes who writes the lives of the philosophers. Um, is it, I mean, Plutarch's actually very nice to like Kyrgyz, but isn't Diogenes a much better character? Yeah, I'm not saying that Plutarch's value judgments are worth anything, but you can, you can distill some of the history mm -hmm. out of this. And then you just, you know, you, you just... Take it as living history. I mean, I just I'd read the letters before, but I never sat down and I never sat down and worked out what we know about the history, and then reread the letters and placed each one of them historically. Because when when you read them, I mean, when you read the letters in the low, somebody numbered them one through fifteen, but they're completely out of chronological order, mm -hmm. and you get completely confused. So normally you sit down and you read the letters and you, you don't know if you're talking about Dionysius the first, Dionysius the second. Plato's often talking about his second trip and he means his second trip under Dionysius the second, but you think it's the third trip. You know, so you can get very, very, very confused. There's a lot of stuff if you just take, but if you just take very seriously that this is living history, this is a political fight, you know the mind of Plato by reading the dialogues. We know how the mind has to think to solve these problems because that's what we've been working on for several years and you just sort of have to put it all together. Another thing, I was, I was really moved by how brave Dion actually is in going into Syracuse. And I was trying to think, well, why Syracuse? And not that I know anything about Syracuse, but it reminded me of the way that Lynn essentially focused on taking over the Democratic Party even though my opinion of the Democratic Party was so low, it really posed a big paradox for me. It's like, why would I help LaRouche take over the Democratic Party? I mean, what's that going to do? And once I started really thinking about it, I realized that it was his intent to do something much bigger than I had right. really looked at. That it wasn't something located in the small. It was, it was a, a, a strategic move. Um, it was something that he felt that he could he could win, and if he won, it would pretty much guarantee a type of success. Right. So I, th I mean, there's an earlier history to Syracuse, for example, Aeschylus, hmm. uh, you know, who fought at the Battle of Marathon, and who wrote these great great plays, most of which unfortunately we don't have. 
Aeschylus at a certain point is exiled or else he just decides to leave Athens in disgust because it's beginning to generate and he goes to Syracuse. He dies in Syracuse. So there's, I mean, there's obviously, there's more history there which could be looked at. Uh, it's in also terms geographically closer to Italy. Yeah. The Pythagorean influence too. Yeah. Easier but I, I think that, that one of the primary things is very much like Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries when they saw that they would not have the power to defeat the oligarchy <coughs> in Europe because it was too entrenched. They had to go <coughs> to a frontier. They had to go someplace the oligarchy wasn't. Yeah. yeah. And you had the heavy, Pyth I mean, the Pythagorean influence. Pythagoras himself was from right about this area, Croton, and then Archytas and Tarentum, and so on. Yeah? How did Plato establish the... Um, I mean, it seems like he would have had to have a pretty good reputation to bounce around in all these different countries and be accepted and whatnot. How was how that established? Um, I, I think you had, I mean, I think there certainly were going back to the time, to the previous century with Pythagoras and Amasis the Pharaoh um, and other people, you did have international networks that knew that the Persians were evil. So you had, you know, it was almost an underground railroad. It wasn't quite that. But, you, you know, you basically had, you had the two contending forces in humanity, people who think human beings are animals and people who think they're not. So you had a, you had a network. I mean, it really is pretty amazing to think about it. I mean, it's not like you called somebody on your cell phone and said, I'm coming, right? Yeah. You know, did you send them a letter, which would take six months to get there? and wait for a reply six months later and then go? Mm -hmm. Or did you send them a letter saying, I'm coming in two months and go? I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's rather mind-boggling to, I mean, you're right, the courage of these people just sort of go out into a world where you don't have instant communication. You know, you set out for Egypt, how do you know the Persians aren't going to overthrow the pharaoh by the time you get there? Mm -hmm. It's not like you're going to get a news flash. <laughs> Was, um, did Socrates have a well-established reputation in these throughout this era? Was he it's that's not so clear to me. Um, I can't imagine that he didn't, but there's no evidence of <coughs> the kind of international influence that Solon had, because Solon also traveled extensively much earlier, and then Plato. Eudoxus is all over the place during this period of time. I don't, I, I, from what I've read of Socrates, um, <coughs> I don't know that he had that same kind of international influence. I mean, I think the thing that's fascinating about Plato is you see it's the intersection of Socrates and then the Pythagoreans. You know, it's not one or the other. You know, and some lunatics say, you know, he's either this or he's that. And, you know, it's a different, you know, his, his uh, Pythagorean ideas are in conflict with his Socratic ideas, which are completely ridiculous. And I, the Republic is one of the most beautiful fusions of the two when you actually study it. John. I was wondering if, um, if you had anything to say about the difference between the conception of philosopher king that Plato had and the conception that Leo Strauss has of a uh, philosopher king. <laughs> um, a, lot of, a lot of Straussians seem to get this wrong. Yeah, I mean, because what... <laughs> they definitely get it wrong. Um, <laughs> Because what the what the I mean what the Straussians do is exactly what Plato the seventh letter actually the seventh letter is an attack on Straussians. I mean the idea that you take the literal text, you know, you take the name and the definition, and that's what it is. That's what you know the truth is. Because what is Plato doing in the Republic? He sets up this entire tension, you know, in the first five books about uh, what you can study and who you can marry and you know all of this kind of stuff, this entire tension for the purpose of posing a paradox. You know, you, you, he's, he set up an axiom, which he sets up in the, first, in the second book in terms of the development of his city and so on. Uh, and he works out that axiom, how you would educate and train people. And then in about book five, he says, he, he's bring, brought you to the limit of that. And then he goes back and he says, but wait a minute. This was all based on training and habits. This wasn't based on people knowing why they were doing what they were doing. 
we've got to relook at everything we've just said from a higher standpoint. And that's why, you know, when you've read The Republic, I mean, this is true of Plato, this is true of drama, it's true of everything. Uh, pay attention to your emotion, emotions. You know, everybody, when they've read The Republic in books three and four and five, you're really agitated. Does he really mean this? You know, and then you get to the point with the, uh, the section they call the eugenics marriages, you know, where you can only marry somebody who's, uh, you know, falls within this numerical time frame and so on and so forth. And there's a couple of places in there where you think he's actually recommending euthanasia and so on. I mean, if you read it seriously, you start going really nuts. And then you get to the end of book five into book six, and all of a sudden you find your mind's in a completely different place. He's talking about hypothesis of the higher hypothesis. He's talking about beautiful ideas. Suddenly you're not agitated anymore. So you go back and you realize that there was a singularity. There was a change in characteristic in the Republic. He's putting you through the kind of pedagogical exercise he describes in the seventh letter, where you deal with the provocatives, the inconsistencies, the things that are, you know, does he really mean that? These two things can't exist and so on. He's putting you through a certain emotional agitation because all knowledge is connected to emotion. And then he's taking you to a different place where he's redefined everything that he talked about in the first five books. Now, what does a Straussian do? A Straussian takes the first five books and says that's Plato's recipe for running society. And that's your, you know, you can lie. That's where the noble lie comes from because it's all within this axiom, axiomatic structure that he set up in the first five books, which he then smashes and transcends and takes you on a wonderful further pedagogical journey and so on. But the Straussian takes the words literally. So, it, I mean, it, it, the question just prompted me to think that the seventh letter really is just a complete refutation of everything, you know, in two pages <coughs> of everything Leo Strauss claims to Seems be. That yeah, it seems that Plato see, uh, has a, an idea of composition like Beethoven's three. Yep. Does anybody remember how the Timaeus begins? One, two, three, four. Yeah. Where's the four? That's a compositional statement. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Work on Menechmus, Eudaxis, and Archytas, and let's see what we find.